This is the first episode of two featuring Patrick Haggerty of Lavender Country, the first openly gay country western artist. Just in case there are young ears in the room, there are instances of profanity in this episode. Are you planning a funeral for a loved one and fear it will end up being morose and lifeless? Are you worried people there will judge you for making it pretty much forgettable? Then let Eulogies or Us provide the perfect balance between respect and entertainment. Hey, I'm Jerry Springer, and I've made talking a career. And I'm Megan Hills, a trained actress. I've played Lady Macbeth, Stella, even Britney Spears. And I'm Gene Galvin, the creator of the Ludlow City Bus Company and the newest comedy sensation, The Elevator Comics. And we can be hired to deliver a tender, memorable eulogy for your loved one in person at your church synagogue, or even your neighborhood bar. Oh, and I can show deep pathos. Watch this. <clears throat> she was a dear woman that we all love. I, I just don't know how we're going to go on without her. <laughs> and I can give a final thought. <clears throat> Old Tommy lying here, well, I guess it was a few months before he died. He was telling me about this new hearing aid he had. And he was so proud of it. He said... Jerry, this is the finest hearing aid money can buy. I said, yeah, what kind is it? He said, four o'clock. And I can even sing mine. Poor Judd is dead. A candle lights his head. He's lying in a coffin made of wood. The steps are simple. You email us some talking points. We drop them into our digital eulogy template. And you say which one of us you want to come. And we'll be there with bells on. Or maybe more like with organ music playing, which for a slight upcharge, we'll play from our cell phones. Eulogies are us, the latest craze in the world of fake news. I had Springer's speech a fight, my cousin Lester was great. And he was hilarious. Best show I'd seen since I looked at Wayne Newton up there at the Indian Casino. Visit eulogiesareus.com or call 1-800-DEAD-GUY for a consultation. Eulogies Are Us is brought to you by Six Feet Under Productions. Welcome to Tales, Tunes, and Tom Fullery, starring Jerry Springer, along with Gene Galvin and me. I'm Megan Hills. We're recorded live in front of a brilliant studio audience at the Folk School Coffee Parlor in Ludlow, Kentucky. Here he is, ladies and gentlemen, the one, the only, home. Jerry Springer. Oh, 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 this is great. This may be the one time we have more people in the band than we do, we do in, in, the in the audience. <laughs> this is great. I think there's about a hundred people in here, and in, in the uh, I thousands, think the, hundreds of thousands, thousands of people. Thousands, thousands. Yeah, and the yeah. fire coat this says is it can a huge only be crowd. About we have pictures of the Actually. crowd. <laughs> but look, we have a nine-piece country band here. Mm -hmm. Yes, we've never. That's a record. In fact, that, that, you can't put more than nine people in there. The Tonight Show doesn't have nine people they don't in have their nine band. People. And included in the, among the nine-piece band and the hundreds, as Megan says, hundreds of thousands of people in the audience at the Folk School Coffee Parlor in Ludlow, Kentucky. Yeah, they built an extension on that. Are, <laughs> our, are our two wives. Yes, yes. Bonnie yes. and Mickey. Mickey Please, Springer, take, Bonnie Galvin. Take, take a bow. Which one? There. Yes. Oh, there they are. Yes. Yeah. Well, oh, oh, that's funny. Speaking, <laughs> yeah. No, actually, uh, speaking of our wife, well, uh, I can tell this story, Mickey. Uh, this weekend, we were with friends. And uh, see if Mickey thinks you can. I know I'm yeah. judging Mickey's face. No, we were with friends, and you know, you're sitting around, and we we're all married for a long time, you know. And I, I tend to be a very romantic guy, I guess. Yeah, you know, that. people. Aww. Know that. No. <laughs> no, well, then they start making fun of me. Yeah, you're you're really romantic. Yeah. Well, what, what what's your wife's favorite flower? And I said, gold medal all purpose flower. Uh, <laughs> isn't yeah. that right, honey? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Hey, and, oh God. and but we had a, uh, it's, hey, it's uh, better than I want to go to Miami. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Can we get a rim well, shot? Well, I'm going to ask the drummer of uh, Lavender Country, the band, I'm going to introduce that. Be ready with a rim shot now and then for these sucky ass jokes, okay? <laughs> there you go. Oh, there you go. <laughs> hey, by the way. We, this is interesting. The, our show has kind of a template. It has kind of a rhythm. It, it's called Tales, 
tunes and tomfoolery. Yep. It has some talk. It has some funny stuff, we hope. And it has music, always music. Thanks to Casey Campbell, our music coordinator, we bring in people from Americana genre of music. Roots, sometimes folk, it might be country, it might be bluegrass, it might be blues. Tonight we're doing what we call a master series, where largely the content, and I'm going to press Jerry to, to speak up on uh, some things that are popping in the news, and I'm going to ask even Patrick Haggerty might help lead us into that. And that's our guest tonight. Patrick Haggerty has a pretty interesting story, and we're going to draw it out of him. He is the leader and the founder of, the, of this nine-piece group, loaded with, frankly, a bunch of young people. Patrick is closer to my age and Jerry's age, and he is Patrick Haggerty, and let's give him a round of applause. <laughs> and a point of introduction on Patrick, and then Jerry's going to ask him to do a song, and we're going to engage him in this conversation. Patrick uh, came out as I have read this story, and we've just been talking a little bit, I've been learning a little bit firsthand from Patrick, as a pretty young man living on, I think, a ranch or a dairy farm, he'll, he'll give us the specifics, back in the, probably the 60s and maybe even earlier, in the state of Washington. And he has had a life as a country western songwriter, performer, I suspect playing in some of the classic country western venues, he was in, and we're going to draw this out of him, the Peace Corps, the Venceremos Brigade in Cuba in the early 70s after the Revolution of 59. The Peace Corps started in the mid-60s, so he was an early member. And we want to hear his experiences as, as an early member of the LGBT community, of coming out early in his life. So that's a, he's, he's had some experiences that are pretty interesting. So, Patrick, welcome, and would you start us off, if you wouldn't mind, with one of your songs? Of course.
Patrick Haggerty. Oh, wow, whoop de doo uh, Yeah, uh, um, many thoughts are going through my mind right at this second because when we first thought about having a podcast and what it would be, part of what we grew up with and what we love is the music and the, the music, the folk music, the music that had a message. And during the 60s, it was civil rights and then it became anti-war and all that. But it always had to do with a message of, of people that didn't necessarily have power, people that were suppressed for whatever reason. And you came out with that song coming out when I, and this is probably my own basic generalizations which make me part of the problem when I was growing up, when I view the generality of country music, um, I don't put that together with gayness. Because I'm thinking, when I think country music, and as much as, and I love country music, that's God's truth, that's my favorite music, period. Mickey will vouch for that. I love it. But when I think of country music, I don't think of people liking this, which is unfair, being very progressive and be very understanding of different lifestyles. And you were, as far as I know, the first in that market, knowing who you were playing to. It's kind of like Charlie Pride when he came into country music as the first African-American big star, is wow. What was that like for you in terms of the acceptance in the community? Did the DJs play your music? Did concert promoters say, oh, I don't know if we can have Patrick? What was it like? Talk to us. Jerry, it wasn't very good. <laughs> mm. um, we made Lavender Country in 1973. People ask me, why country? I'll tell you the truth. It was the only thing I knew how to do. Mm. <laughs> okay? <laughs> I'm from the country. I'm rural. I was raised by a dad who, you know, had Farmer Brown overalls and cow crap on his jeans and clodhopper boots and half his teeth. And he was Pa Kettle. He looked like Pa Kettle. He wasn't Pa Kettle. There's more about that. But those are my roots. And my father was magically wonderful to me about this marvelous I can't even talk to you without crying. My father was so wonderful. Let me tell you a story. Just to give... Hmm. I'm six years old. I say, Dad, let me use your jackknife. Oh, hell to the no. I'm not going to let you use my jackknife. You're way too young to use a jackknife. Why do you want a jackknife anyway? I'm playing a game. What kind of game? Kid long hair with my sister Jenny. Jenny's got long hair and I don't got no long hair and I need some long hair. And you got that blonde balentwine in the garage. I need about 20 strands of it so I can make me a wig. And he said, oh, well, you're still too young to have a jackknife, but I'll help you make the wig. How many strands of uh, blonde balentwine do you think you need? I said about 20. 20? You can't have 20 strands of my Balin Twine. I'm trying to run a dairy farm here. How about if I give you 10 and you kind of wrap the ends and you can wear a beehive? <laughs> I said, Dad, little Catholic girls don't wear beehives. I gotta have me the 20 strands. So he muttered and cussed and cut me the 20 strands and measured my head and tied them up and said, okay, there you go. You didn't really deserve 20 strands. And uh, it's quarter to three, and you got to be at Johnson's Field at 4 o'clock to get the cows, and if you're not there, there'll be hell to pay. So you got one hour and 15 minutes to be beautiful. So you better get cracking. Who gets a dad like that, right? Who gets a dad like that? And he, he handled it so adroitly, so like a ballerina, that what I thought happened that day 
was it was the day my dad taught me how to use a jackknife. I had no comprehension of what he had done for me. How was that reception different than when you entered the music field? And <laughs> yeah. Oh, let me talk about that. <clears throat> Jerry, it really wouldn't have mattered what genre we chose in 1973 when we made Lavender Country. There wasn't any genre that was going to take a song like Crying These Scock Sucking Tears and play it or do anything gay. There wasn't any genre that would have us. So why not country? We, everybody was going to throw it out anyway, and I was country, and that's what I knew how to do. So it, it, to me, it didn't matter what genre. We were excluded. We did gay prides around the Northwest and sure. down to San Francisco. But except for the, the, the out, coming out, lesbians and gays in the movement, nobody was interested in Lavender Country. No, the disc jockeys didn't play me. No, I didn't get all kinds of gigs playing country. Are you kidding? Are you out of your mind? Well, yeah. Didn't happen. <laughs> but not because of your issue. I'm just out of my mind. No, it didn't happen. Yeah. It was total exclusion. Mm. For 40 years, I did, not, I did not plan on making a career doing gay country music. Let me tell you that. I wasn't that stupid. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so you, you performed then your country music without being that being I, the purpose. I did, all, I did folk music and country music yeah. and Joan Baez and the Weavers and all sure. that stuff. I sure. was all up into that stuff. Yeah. As soon as I made a gay country album, that was it. I was excluded from the music industry altogether in all genres. So when, when did you, it change? I'm sorry. Oh, oh, no, when you say you made a gay country album, so you were using the, 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 um, the topics and everything were homosexual topics, and that's what you were singing about. So you weren't masking it. You weren't trying to be something you were. You were just 100% yourself. Yeah. Wow. So that had a double... A double, uh, Entendre, double un, meaning. yeah. One, it excluded us from everything. But the beauty of it was, we knew we were going to be excluded from everything. We knew that nobody was going to buy our stuff. So we weren't cottoning to any industry. We weren't watering ourselves down so that somebody would play us and find us acceptable. When did that change? About three years ago. Okay. Yeah. Right. <laughs> well, that's around the time when America f started to really come around, for example, on gay marriage. In other words, uh, It was a gay marriage issue. That, yeah. That, I mean, there was a buildup before that, but the gay marriage issue was really the one that took it over I the agree. top and allowed the whole gay issue to go into the mainstream and people having to, to buy in. And... Um, then the music industry has changed a lot. A straight white men have a lot of power. We all know that. They still have a lot of power in all aspects of our lives. And they have a lot of power in the music industry. And it was a straight white man who suppressed Lavender Country for 40 years. But interestingly now, kind of straight white man who goes into the music industry, who's interested in lavender country, they're a completely different brand. They're on board. They're for civil rights. They're for human rights. They've sorted out all that stuff in their own minds. They know they're pro-gay. And they come across something like lavender country, and they go, I want a show the world, that I'm on this side of this line, yeah. and I'm going to revive a review about Lavender Country, and I'm going to tell my other buddies about Lavender Country, and I'm going to put Lavender Country on the radio, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Straight white men have that kind of power. When they found Lavender Country, 
That's what they did with it. Do you have a channel on Sirius XM? Pardon me? Do you have a, a channel uh, on Sirius XM radio, like for gay country music or... No, I don't have that. I don't even know what you're talking about. <laughs> well, I usually don't either. Oh, my uh, heck. <laughs> yeah. No, because right now, satellite radio, uh, satellite radio is so diversified. In other words, there is, you know, there's a, a radio channel just for Sinatra. There's one for French country music. So what I'm saying is you have a constituency that I would think commercially, from your book, I'm not trying to be your agent, but commercially, Go ahead. yeah, uh, uh, 10 percent. Uh, you can the, have uh, it. Yeah, yeah. If Jerry Springer will yeah. be my agent, you can have yeah. 20. Okay. Yeah, yeah. There is there is some Jewish in you. Uh, how about so? Uh, I, I've been called one before. Oh uh, yeah, yeah. Me too. And uh, <laughs> no, so uh, but no. Seriously, you ought to. Look into that because there is an audience for every kind of music, and there is such a what I would say now a large audience for your music that I'm suggesting you ought to do something with that. In I, addition to what you're doing, I'm I should do that. Mostly, I've been stumbling forward dealing with whatever presented itself in front of me. Sure, yep. play, play another song. I want to hear right, your let's music. Let's do that. I wrote this song, Cuba. Um, trying to bust into the movement, right? We're at the bottom of the heap. We're not at the bottom of the heap now. So other people are at the bottom of the heap. But let's get real. There's no bottom of the heap. We're all in this together. You're here. Yeah. So that's what this song's about. Ostensibly, it's about gay men, but it's about all of us being on the same boat together. You remember Gene Autry, right? You'll get it. The kids, they don't, they don't get this song, but y'all will, because you'll remember.
sure never had it like this, right? Hey, Patrick, uh, you referenced Cuba to that song. Yes. And I wanted to ask you something, even before you go to Cuba, because I, in 1966, was in the VISTA program. We called that the Domestic Peace Corps. And it was... I went to India, Arissa, in a poultry project, which, frankly, wasn't very successful. Um, in the first place, there was, like... 200 kids, and there were like two of us who'd ever raised a chicken. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so that was like bad planning, right? I happened to be one of the ones who'd raised a chicken. <laughs> um, I did not have a fully formed consciousness as a homosexual when I was in India in 1966. At the age of about? 20. You got it. Mm -hmm. I was 21. I was not fully formed. It was a pre-stone wall. I was raised in a Catholic family. Well. And I was um, trying to sort out the issues. And I fell in love with my roommate. Big time. <laughs> Deep. <laughs> I love him to this day. We're still good friends, by the way. I don't know how we survived all this, but we did. It got to be an issue. It was like, Jerry, I'm not going to spend one more night in the bedroom with you in this house. It's too hard. Oh, well, I can see that. Why don't you move in with Randy down the road so we can continue to do our work together and be the good friends that we are. He was a very good friend. He was straight as an arrow. So we decided we were, that's what we were going to do. So the Peace Corps office in Calcutta found out about it, and they sent a doctor down to find out what was going on. And he said, what's going on? And I said, I fell in love with my roommate, and I don't think it's a good idea for me to watch him get undressed every night. So I'm going to move in with Randy down the road so we can continue our work together. That's what's going on. 24 hours later, I was kicked out of the Peace Corps. Flat ass on my butt. Painful. Oh. You know, one of the reasons I wanted you, I didn't know the story specifically. You just told it. I got to tell you, Number one, that was the place, Peace Corps Vista, run by liberals, liberal Democrats, who you would think even in 1966 wouldn't have the double standard, because I'm going to tell you something. There were Vista volunteers, and I know Peace Corps volunteers, I know this happened there too, where if a straight man and a straight woman in country, in assignments, hooked up, they didn't kick them out of the Peace Corps that I knew. They didn't do it in Vista. And that was a double standard of what you experienced in 66, and that's part of your point of how things were even in the most liberal enclaves. Of course. I mean, there was 250 of us in this Peace Corps, men well, li and women. Liberalism progressed more quickly politically than it did culturally. Politically, it, it progressed because of the civil rights issue, which was a significant part of the population, and because of the war in Vietnam. So that brought a lot of people having to choose 
sides, liberal or conservative, and that made them liberal, but they weren't there culturally yet. And the cultural liberalism probably started uh, in the 1970s with the women's movement. That is when people started to become sensitive to cultural issues. So you could be a flaming peace, going to Woodstock and all that, and you know, let's get out of the war and all that kind of stuff, but you weren't there culturally. That, that, that took time. But the good news with all of this is the arc of history is moving to the left. The world is becoming more liberal. Every generation is more liberal than the generation before it. And what happens, even with modern day elections, even with a Trump election, it is still the country's moving to the left and you could interpret the Trump election as much as the last stand of a group of people who just think that multicultural America and liberal America is moving too fast in that direction, and this was their last stand. They didn't vote for Trump because they said this guy is the most qualified person in the world. It's just that this is a way they can make a statement to everything they see in the media, everything they see on television, everything they see in the social media, everything they talk to their kids about. Everybody's becoming much more liberal, and this is not how they grew up, and they can't stand it anymore. So we'll vote for somebody like Trump, you know, probably knowing full well that he doesn't know what the hell he's doing. But this is our last... Stand, not my last stand, but they're saying our last stand against the multiculturalization and liberalization of America. That is what's going on, and you were at the forefront of this. But the good news is, generation to generation, liberals always win. Long, long battle. We lose individual battles, but overall, we'll be much more liberal 20 years from now. History always moves forward. Yeah. Yep. Take us out on uh, down by the riverside, would you? Sure. And we've loved having you here tonight and you the entire band. I'm serious. So great, we appreciate great, it. Great, great. Thank you, guys. Lavender Country, Patrick Haggerty, down by the riverside. Tales, Tunes, and Tom Fullery, recorded live at the Folk School Coffee Parlor in Ludlow, Kentucky. Thanks to Patrick Kennedy for writing our opening song, and to you for listening. Check out our website at jerryspringer.com. Ain't gonna chase me women no more. Ain't gonna chase me women no more. Thirty years, thirty years. Gonna lay down my sword and shield down by the riverside. First episode of Two featuring Patrick Haggerty of Lavender Country, the first openly gay country western artist.